Lazarus, very happy man today uh, for the next hour and a half, at least, to be welcoming back uh, one of my dearest friends and somebody who's been contributing enormously to the great revelations which we are bringing forth on the Lazarus Initiative, the Lazarus Symposium. Uh, thrilled to welcome Jane Evershed, our resident artist and researcher, fellow of the uh, New Earth University, and uh, coming back on the Lazarus Initiative Symposium for, for, I think, the third or fourth time. Jane, happy to see you, though. Very nice to be here, Sasha. I'm excited to share my findings. Indeed. Uh, so in today's discussion, we're shedding light on the profound and enduring impact that modern art has had on our society and collective consciousness. We're exploring how art traditionally regarded as a reflection of society's virtues, vices, hopes and fears serves as a tool to shape reality and uh, steer human consciousness. Delving into the influence of popular art movements and the ongoing ramifications of CIA infiltration into the art world. So we're also examining other uh, significant cultural influences throughout the modern art era by unpacking complex concepts like uh, bio art, extropic art, hybrid art, and uh, transhumanist art as well. We'll unveil the ultimate aims of these influences whilst touching on the communist undertones in the backdrop of modern art by communist um the, the reference is really speaking to collectivism uh, cultural marxism which is annihilation of real art ironically I, I, annihilation of uh, of individuality and sovereignty and all of that the kind of heinous shit that we're seeing playing out on the geopolitical uh, and socioeconomic landscape today all around the world as jane has been pointing out to the symposium. Part of her extraordinary research has been to discover, uh, I think for the first time, and start to uh, uh, triangulate and put together um, these sort of epochal moves that have been had and have been made against uh, humanity using totemism, using symbology, using art itself. Uh, so Jane, I hope that that's a relatively um, comprehensive um, introduction to where we're going. We're going to be triggering your presentation. Um, I'm going to be triggering it from here and intuitively we're going to make our way through it. So the way it's going to look, friends, uh, for you is something like this. Okay, we've got the presentation there. Uh, Jane and I will be variously uh, on the left. So Jane, let's take it away. I mean, at the first uh, slide here, um, the question, what makes modern art a vital component in understanding humanity's conscious awakening and why should individuals take the time to explore and educate themselves about art? Well, the number one thing is that art is a major factor in humanity's positive conscious evolution and modern art stands alone as a visual metaphor for everything that is transpiring in our world right now. It's like the ghost of mind control. You see it, but you don't really see it. That's my job is to make it visible to you. And it's also the forerunner of visual propaganda before motion pictures. And the people who are in control have continued to use it as a tool of mind control in conjunction with movies and TV because it is such a powerful medium. Yeah. And also the entire period known as modern and contemporary art is mind manipulation. It's one of the major reasons the planet is in the state it is in today. And people just don't realize this, you know. There's a, there's a malaise surrounding modern art that shouldn't be there because everybody's turned away from it. People have Understood. Become so looking here at Dada and Dadaism, I mean, that was an entire... Um, genre, right? That, yes, that genre was an entire genre, an entire movement. So are you suggesting, are we suggesting that Dada was a PSYOP or was it a legitimate organic uh, movement in art which was then co-opted? It's so funny that you honed in on Dada. You're so intuitive, Sasha. That's my big, my big hurrah, you know? And it's later on in the presentation or we could go straight to it if you want but it's all about tesla and dada oh how interesting well let's get to it if it's in the slideshow it would probably make more sense that we we just get to it so i'm going to um toggle forward um next slide here 
Well, the main way they got to us was through the through our eyes, the windows of our soul. And we know that the Catholic Church has always been interested in owning our soul. So, and that's one of our five senses. So that's how they got to us, through the sense of our eyes. You can just okay. see how in Tartaria there was this beauty and majesty around surrounding our lives and the way we lived and then jump to the future and you see the crap they produced, that pink sculpture there that everyone called pink poop and how the cities have deteriorated, which is all by design. And then you've got the French Ministry of Culture trying to cover up their building with some stylish, wiry decoration. And in Paris too, which I consider the cultural center of the world, they have one of those Egyptian obelisks, you know, that we are the all powerful Babylonians, so listen to us. And this excruciatingly slow walk diabolical plan has been going on since the Renaissance and it reveals the visual and psychological shenanigans of art so that humanity can see and embrace an organic conscious evolution and reject their superficial and synthetic version of evolution. So it, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because it really does come back. It really does come back to what we've been speaking to on the Lazarus Initiative for actually a couple of years now, which is that the, the images that uh, imprint us and that influence us, the icons and symbols and influences that are put out there in order um, to corral our uh, mind's eye into a certain metric um, and then create a feedback because humans are capacitors. The universe itself is a divine feedback loop capacitor. And when we're fed bad ideas, bad totems, degraded imagery and so on, especially uh, you have to emphasize kids and, um, and universities, institutions of learning, then that process of degradation, corruption, erosion of high aesthetic, of, of, of the golden principles, the angelic templates, all of those become corrupted in the mind's eye, yes? Absolutely. So let's move on to, is this the next one? Yeah, that's it. And this is an example of how they took the Tartarian structures and co-opted them into their own cultural centers. Because we're in the third reset now to take over the world since the Renaissance. And this is the Tartaria that was ransacked. And they took all these famous art museums and usurped them to, you know, they stole the cultural magnificent magnificence of Tartaria and used it to twist it into a new and effective cultural propaganda system. And, you know, because of the release of the maps of Grand Tartaria that we know where this architecture came from now and that, that the art institutions were founded much later. Right. So, so then tell me, what you said that this is the third reset since the Renaissance. So the, when were the others? The Renaissance was the first one. Then there was post Tartaria 1800s where they stole all their technology and usurped all their buildings and everything. And now this is the third one that we're in now where Klaus Schwab and his gang are trying to do their reset. And the funny thing is that these, uh, this new modern art just looks so funny in all these Tartarian buildings that they had to build new modern buildings. But what I added here was the fact that I looked up what a, a student herself had told about her experience at art school. And she said that, that modern art is the death of creativity for me I felt like I died inside when I was doing modern art to conform in order to get my degree. I didn't feel free, nor did I feel like the art I enjoyed doing was even being appreciated. And they wanted me to do more messes than create the art I would be proud of. Wow. So you can see, wow. yeah, you can, that's a great uh, illustration of what's going on in these. It's incredible. I went to an art academy. I don't know if you went to formal training, but I went to an arts academy in the 1980s. And um, and at that time, there was for sure, albeit it was in sub-Saharan Africa, where we both come from, but they were 
they were definitely still promulgating the golden mean and sacred geometry and um you know the, the golden principle behind optics were definitely still being taught the classical um art education classical sculpture classical fine arts and so on um so that that particular uh angle of degradation i don't know when when it really came in it seems to me that um that the kind of tracy emin dirty bed with menstrual smears and the um and the uh, and the what's his damien hurst pickled sheep uh, brand of of um brand of materialistic egoistic um fallacious nonsense that school it seems to me is what really gave birth to the corruption in the modern context with the kind of sachi and sachi element speak to that yes absolutely i do go into that later on as well how it's called shock art shock art movement so we'll right. just we'll and, and, but it, it's so it's so it's so uh, in alignment isn't it with the whole pornographicized high street and reality framing that's been going on in the last 20 or 30 years really really since the 70s and 80s it's so so into it as long as you make a big loud um noise and and create some kind of shock or some kind of trauma imprint then you're you're making a statement in this world and you should be valued and you should be accoladed and you should be rewarded that's kind of the perverse notion isn't it exactly so then they had to build all these modern art museums very much very ugly buildings as far as i'm concerned because that the, that awful art you were just talking about just didn't fit into the grandness of the Tartarian structures. Right. So when, where, why, and how are the visual arts being usurped? Okay, well, the when is one of the most, it was when one of the most well-known art schools in the world had to be approved by the king in order to maintain Obtain control and set the standard for art well into the future. And that, of course, was the Royal Academy of Arts in London, which was founded in 1768 by a group of 40 artists and architects that had to be approved by George III. And he funded that Royal Academy. So it just organically arise. And it's also my belief that the Illuminati took over from the Roman Catholic Church as their henchmen after the Roman Catholic Church had caused so much bloodshed and mayhem in the world across Europe. And this is verified by the fact that James Mayer de Rothschild with Pope Gregory in the, the Gregory the 16th, he oversaw the loan deal between the Rothschild family and the Holy See, and that was in 1832. Right. right, which then made it happen that the Rothschilds then basically owned the Catholic Church from that point on. I had been guessing this for a while, but here it is in black and white. And so they took over all financial operations of the Catholic Church at that time. And so after the Renaissance, then the domain of the arts came under the Illuminati control. And, you, you know, it was then, too, that they formed that Committee of 300, global leaders that was in 1727 is that right and so for over a century they've uh, we both know they've plotted world domination with the goal of a one world government which i had never heard of this before but it's also known as the human domestication project which makes sense because they do see us like cattle but they knew how powerful right art is so they sought to set it up as both a propaganda tool and a cover-up tool fantastic and what you what you just we just said a, a, a moment ago um about yeah i mean just look at the quote there when we went to propagate concepts among mankind we emblazon when we want to propagate concepts among mankind we emblazon them on stone or canvas to wield constructive influence over civilization eyes wide shut baby eyes wide shut 
So the origin of financing art to serve an agenda not long after the Renaissance reset is perfectly explained by this bloke, Barthélemy Prosper Enfantin, and um, he was a French political scientist, and he also frequent this, frequented the secret society of Carbonari, which sounds very Italian, but they had a branch in Paris. And he was one of the first to advocate for a government-promoted bank to offer capital at reduced interest rates for socially productive activities such as the arts. Such as mind control. Exactly. So they knew what they were doing right from the beginning. And this was the beginning of the avant-garde. You know, you always hear this term thrown around, the avant-garde. What it really means is the vanguard. And it's a military, a military term. So the, the avant-garde held these revolutionary social and political objectives with a desire to deconstruct and rebuild social institutions that were viewed as inextricably linked to conventional standards of aesthetics. So it was one of the major art movements of the 20th century. And always on paper, this sounds so good, but when you look at the repeat, 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 you see this is a futurist ideal and futurism is connected to fascism. Yeah, yeah. And just looking at the quotes again uh, by Benjamin Rodriguez, the, the guy on the left there, the power of the arts is indeed the most immediate and fastest way to realize social, political, and economic reforms. Wow. And that statement was made in the 17th, well, in the in the early 19th century, in 18, in the 18, presumably when he was a, a, an adult. That that's extraordinary. And then Claude Henri de whatever the fuck his name is. I can't look, I can't Simon. What is it? Saint Simon, just call him Saint Simon. Got it, 1760 to 1825. Um, and the quote from him, when we want to propagate concepts among mankind, we, oh, we emblazon them on stone or canvas. So that he was the guy who made that quote. Right, and then if you look at the art, you'll see we were already starting to go into this erotic lesbian and they claim that that picture there of that woman is, is a woman but it's really, I think it's a man. And then you see today's avant-garde, very ugly. There's no talent in it. Yeah, yeah. All of that. Museum so, of Modern Art, MoMA, which is really the hallmark and the standard for modern art now in the world. Absolutely. This is the where in America, the Rockefellers took up this mantle of propagating concepts among mankind through art from the avant-garde. And the idea for the Museum of Modern Art was said to be developed by his wife. You know, we'll just let the ladies take care of it kind of thing. Meanwhile, they're deadly serious about this whole art yeah. realm. And, it, and so she started it with a couple of her friends and, and John D. Rockefeller Jr., he, he first he feigned absolute public disdain for modern art, but that was a ruse. And in time he became MoMA's greatest benefactor. And then it was, you mentioned the CIA earlier, it was just 10 years after the, Metro, the Museum of Modern Art was established yeah. That, that MoMA and the CIA conspired to use unwitting artists to promote American propaganda during the Cold War. Yeah. So right. modern art right. played this role in American intelligence, you know, starting in 1939, which was just before the Second World War. Right. And this is the how, is the idea of financing art to serve an agenda, as the avant-garde spoke of. They eagerly devoured this and implemented it. And more, more than any other dynasty, the Rockefeller family, they owned it more than any of the other robber barons too. And they were really quick to make this connection between innovation and the arts. And they didn't, they didn't want any outside innovators coming in. So they really, really protected it, you know? 
And the very the most interesting thing about this, they had their backup all lined up because they were the ones who awarded a significant grant that facilitated in the creation of Tavistock. Yeah. But more more interesting than that was before Tavistock was founded in 1946, it was officially the War Propaganda Bureau in Wellington House. Not many people know that. And almost all of the founders of that War Bureau were psychiatrists. So the Tavistock Institute managed to successfully coerce the populace of the United States to participate in World War I when the majority of the American people were opposed to it. So this gives you an idea of how powerful it is and that it is directly connected to the arts. Oh, and this is so interesting in nine, because this is where we left off with the prehistoric art. Because yeah, and that, that, the question obviously is, can you give some examples of early modern art that fulfilled the mission statement of the avant-garde? Yeah, it was the it was the masks of the indigenous people which originally inspired Picasso, and he stole their mask imagery and made it into his own work, and thus began the extended age of the artistic ravaging and fragmentation of the human species as the new artist behind him followed suit because he was so popular. So I'm having a little bit of difficulty with this because I'm a huge fan of uh, Pablo Picasso. And I'm, I'm wondering um, to what, it, I mean, to how that, that comes about. Um, I mean, I genuinely think that the man was very masterful in so many extraordinary ways um i don't i've never viewed him as just being a kind of piece of shit reductionist um opportunistic um womanizing uh, <laughs> man of great appetite i mean he was he was all of the above i'm certain of that but i do think there's been real um lucid genius coursing through his work i agree with you sasha but, you know, he was a fervent communist. He even won an award, as you'll see later. You, your instincts are absolutely correct. He, he literally used women to death. And um, I'll go into that a little bit later. But, yeah, I agree with you. He was very, very talented, but he was definitely a henchman of the propaganda machine. Interesting. Let's have a look so, at that. And there we go. Yeah. It, it, it was him who started to paint women with these gross distortions and angular bodies. And then the other movements followed suit, you know, where women became metallic looking in vorticism and futurism. And you'll see why in a moment, because they were slowly m making women into metal because they were getting them ready to help in the war effort. The First World War was coming up. And this is what, what Picasso actually said about women. He said, women are machines for suffering. He told his mistress, uh, whose name was Francois Gillot. And after they had an affair, when he was 61, she was 21, and he warned her of his feelings. He said, for me, there are only two kinds of women, goddesses and doormats. And Marina saw her grandfather's treatment of women as an even darker phenomenon, a vital part of his creative process. He submitted them to his animal sexuality, tamed them, bewitched them, ingested them, and crushed them onto his canvas after he had spent many nights extracting their essence once they were bled dry. Very interesting. And I know that he di he died a horrible death, um, sort of angst-ridden death. It was no there was nothing noble or gracious or peaceable about his exit from the world. It was kind of, you know, clawing at the ceiling and howling and uh, what have you, which is exactly the mark of an ignoble soul. You know, if if you've become overrun with, I guess, false light and egoism and appetite then you become quite ghoulish um salvador dali similarly ended horrible end to both dala uh, uh, dala uh, dali uh, dali and uh, gala both of them came to horrible ends there's an interesting pathology there no absolutely yeah 
I didn't know that about Picasso. Thanks for telling me. Um, wow. So within just a decade before World War I, artists removed the nurturing element from women by portraying women as angular and metallic, as I said before, no longer curvaceous. And then once women had been portrayed as metallic machines, it's just a short jump after that to employing them into participating in war because they're visual, they've seen it, you know. And yeah. I believe this, this was the implanted visual psychology the art that preceded war did manage to accomplish, but I don't know that anyone has ever seen that or said that before. And it's a classic war campaign, which got these women to produce weapons of mass destruction for false altruistic reasons yeah. against yeah. their own species. This is what's so crazy about it. Yeah, it's it's very it's very um, it's very nested into the um inverse geometry of satanism the sabbatean agenda of how you create counterpoints um and bring about a the parasite the cannibalistic element infiltrates the cultural values and well, it's taking moral sorry. Framework, the moral framework becomes completely perversified is so what you're seeing women here now flexing muscles as you say um doing a u-turn against their primal instinct of being the nurturer the mother the life bearer and turning it into the the opposite it's quite disgusting yes well you just um explained in brief what i had in my notes so we yeah. can move on <laughs> okay okay let's see that there we go So, the dark movement was lauded anti-war, yet they ignored all this devastation within their art. So this is, you see this devastation. So art played a major role in both the world wars by way of the propaganda art movements, and they were actually called propaganda art movements. And, you know, you would think that this has nothing to do with modern art, but it does because we are in the middle of another attempted reset right now. And this destruction that you see here was part of the whole design of destroying that world that we had then. And now we're busy destroying the world we have now. Look what just happened on Maui. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And also this when the Habsburgs were deposed from Austria and Hungary. So I think it was a kind of a dynasty war as well. So you had London, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, Prague, Moscow, Athens, Rome, all these countries being absolutely destroyed and wiped out. The worst one being Ypres. And, and there was about 19 million soldiers and civilians who died. And it was just a horrible, horrible war. And all these women were a part of it. Wow. Wow. Without them, the war wouldn't have even happened. So I know you're going to love this little part, Sasha, because these are all the little groups that get formed organically. You know what I mean? Yeah. Th these little groups that they say popped up out of nowhere, you know, 90% of them are communist, collectivist, socialist little groups. Yeah. And they're all programmed and everything else to, you know, generate whatever it is. Now, here we are at this very interesting part where I was looking at photographs of Marcel Duchamp and I'm yeah. looking at them and I'm thinking, what is this reminding me of? What is this reminding me of? And then I find that the piece he did is called The Bride Stripped Bear by Her Bachelors. And it was begun in 1915 in New York City. So I looked up when Nikola Tesla was doing his uh, Tesla coil, if you just move on to the next slide, and you'll see that it was in 1915 that he was stripped bare of all of his money and everything from J.P. Morgan, the robber baron. Wow. And so obviously it was all the talk around town, and one of the data artists, Francois Picabia, I don't know how to pronounce his name, 
he was doing these farcical diagrams that looked exactly like Tesla's. As you can see the comparison there with his above and Tesla's below. And also Marcel Duchamp was creating things that look similar to Tesla's iconic Tesla coil and Wardenclyffe Tower. So you can see yeah. how they were making a parody out of him on a very, very subliminal level. But why Why do you say that? Why could it not have been that they were um, lauding Tesla and honoring him um, symbolically? Because I'll give you some of the, the names of the titles of the diagrams that Pika Beer did. One is called... Um, Oh, I took them out of here. But there's a there's a bodice of a woman's underwear in one of the diagrams. And then the middle one is, a, is that's actually supposed to be a woman. And so it's a complete parody of his diagrams. This is what happened after Picasso started going crazy with his faces all the way through time through modern art now we have to put up with all these distorted fragmented images that we see as a reflection of ourselves and it imprints on our psyches and this is what this is the result it's the fragmenting of our faces to fragment our minds on a subconscious level and just constantly being portrayed as disfigured, it becomes a mirror to us when really we are very, very beautiful people. You know, we were told we started out as apes and we're going to inevitably devolve into a post-humanist state and all in between that, we're just as ugly as sin. Let me get to the next one. And then you see Francis Bacon and, you know, in humanity never fell, we were broken as you can yep. see, the slow reset of our perception of self. And if you, it's called contemporary art, which ties into temporous and temporal. And finally, from the old French, it means of time, temporary relating to time as opposed to eternity. So there you see the connection between time and contemporary art which ends, there's no eternity. We don't get to move on and ascend. We stop and we become their little toys. So there's a lot to read into it. Um, if you could go to slide 22. Oh, and I just- 22 is that one. Yeah, that's it. And, and I wanted to just say how somehow this visual toxicity of modern art has been overlooked and underestimated and its harmfulness as visual technology has been very damaging and it's just as effective as MK Ultra in my mind. Yeah. And then here we see other notable or major areas where modern art has had a profound effect on humanity, and that is our sexual identities. Going back as far as 1513, now again, this ugly man <laughs> on the left is said to be a woman with some kind of bone deformity, and they insist these first two images are women. I really don't think they are. I think it's this early transhumanist stuff creeping in. You've got, and then you've got Marcel Duchamp in 1921 running around talking about the androgyne, you know, and that if one has to become the androgyne, one will no longer have a need for philosophy. And he's the famous guy, you know, that did the urinal. And then here we are in the present future in 2021 with our, it's called now gender non-conforming. Yes. Give us a synopsis on some of the more popular art movements of modern and contemporary art and how they were used to affect the populace, especially with regards to Tavistock and its influence um, on culture writ large. Okay, well, one of Tavistock's specialty domains is culture. So you can be sure that they were sending directives to the art academies. And over time, in these tiny incremental steps, the academies 
with all their new ideologies were usually attributed to small independent factions. Like, you know, those little groups I told you of that, that suddenly blossom, little groups yes. of people. Yes. And so with Dada, well, with Art Deco, for instance, they introduced materialism, fascism, yes by way yep. of futurism, anarchy by way of Dada, because it was also known as an anarchist movement. Then the pro-war sentiment came in by way of the propaganda art. And then you've got insanity levels by way of shock art. And then finally you have today manipulated science by way of the environmental movement, which in interesting emerged as far back as the 60s to affect social and political issues relating to nature. Right. And so the most interesting thing I thought was that here we have one art period during the Byzantine or Byzantine period, there's one art movement. And in modern art, there's been 200 movements in 150 years. And the Byzantine period was said to have lasted a thousand years. So that just illustrates so clearly how much they need this art to progress forward with their agenda. And a really great example of that was when they tried to sell us prehistoric art, you know, to have us believing that we were apes. They just threw out Darwin and then they came up with the cave art, which I call modern art. I classify it as modern art because it's fake. And then they put out the books. It just and eighty-one percent of the population believe that we came from apes. You know, the last time I checked. Yes, yes. So I want to touch on something here now, just as a, a prompt and a reminder to to the the audience about the mechanics of this kind of civilizational mindfuckery. <laughs> and why why is it how is it that these forces um that would subjugate humanity over such vast swathes of time and go to such inordinate lengths to do so why if they are so formidable so all powerful don't they just wave their magic anunnaki wand and murder us all or turn us into what they want us to be or blah, 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 blah. The reason is they cannot. They cannot do it because they, in and of themselves, cannot command life force. Ideation has to come through an angelic capacitor. That's the human being. So they have to surreptitiously, through chicanery and trickery and um, and witchery and enticement and all of these different um, machinations of control and infiltration, they have to um, essentially get humanity to be the ones to project their plasma into the field to manifest the outcome desirous to those forces. So that's the thing. It always comes back to this because the cynic looks at these kinds of um, shows that we're doing. I read a lot of comments, thousands of them every week, Jane. And the kind of comments are, well, if this was true and they're all that powerful and, and vast in their capacity, why don't they just create the universe that they want? They can't create anything. <laughs> they need our creative currency to do it. That's right. why they have to be so patient because they're right. taking us by the hand and telling us where to go and what to make for their agenda. And we foolishly are not taking our own creative currency and owning it for our positive conscious evolution. Exactly right. There we go. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at this Weiwei guy, a big famous Chinese artist that hit the scene. And he's standing there breaking a million dollar Han Dynasty vase. And this is the same philosophy again as if you want the new, you have to break the old, which is again, futurism, which is fascism. Yeah. But you can yeah. see he's completely taken on the whole mantra of Andy Worrell with the, the Coca-Cola 
branding, bright red, garish, international corporate marketing recognition type of art. And um, it's an exercise in iconoclasm because it yells multinational market domination and then they go straight to the top. You know, that's why they use these commercial logos. And I just wanted to show that part, how they, and they, they keep having to regurgitate genres too. They keep yeah, regurgitating because yeah. they run out of, just like we always have to watch Cinderella every year. You know, why right. not a new theater or something? Oh, that's interesting. Not thought about that one. Yes, indeed. Or the Nutcracker. Yeah, they're just these constant on repeat. That's that's correct. Yeah, that that, 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 that like commercial sport. Mm, mm. You know, when yeah. you, you know, you got the players, you've selected them, they're positioned, they're divided into their genre teams, that kind of thing. Yeah, and and different kinds of humans identify with different archetypes. So you're watching Winnie the Pooh, and it's little. Are you Tigger or are you Eeyore or are you Winnie the Pooh? It's it's so true. Iconoclasticism is is really the the name of the game there. Um, let's move on to the next slide, which is and just looking at this and speaking momentarily to Andy Warhol. You raised you raised the specter of Andy Warhol, and it, it's curious how um, he became so much a part of the kind of vernacular and the and the uh, um, this is source coding of 1960s, 70s, 80s New York. New York, of course, leading um, modern eclecticism, eclecticism, being the, the, the you know at the vanguard of that, and the sort of high society in New York um, also em embodying and, and exemplifying, in a sense, that fringe element. As you were saying, the Tavistockians or the, uh, uh, the those. Uh, the wives of the Sabbatean billionaires masquerading as being philanthropists and as being um, patrons of the arts when all they are is dope pushes on a monumental scale, uh, just pushing um, this kind of mass uh, propaganda. But Andy Warhol in, in his life certainly exemplified the kind of uh, artist becoming the art piece, so to speak, you know, his personality, his lifestyle albeit shoddy in my view um nothing nothing venerable in my view about andy warhol i've read about his life i i have many friends who knew him certainly some of them have died by now now uh, i never heard anything awful about the man but certainly his life seems to me to exemplify a shoddy reductivist um and just not very noble pursuit in the arts in any way shape or form as you said it's iconoclasticism how can simply making a big fucking coca-cola sign or having that tattooed on a pig's butt how does that in any way shape or form um take us dial us into the patterns of perfection it can't and it won't and it was never intended to so let's just momentarily speak about andy warhol do you think that Andy Warhol himself, other than being uh, this kind of distortion uh, archetype, archetype of distorted values, distorted life, distorted sexuality, distorted semblance of, of aesthetic, all of that, was he, a, was he privy to what he was doing? Or was he just doing it from art school and then being heavily financed, as I believe people like Tracy Eminent and her star as well they are kind of in a sense picked up and then financed by the sarchis and sarchis of this world the kind of fringe illuminati set will then take those artists forward and exemplify them because they're doing the work for them but the artist oftentimes is not in on the deal what do you think well i think it's just the same as celebrities and movie stars and all of that it's the same thing you know you get into it and there you are you're stuck i think i agree with you he's a pretty meek man he did get to meet the pope you know for goodness knows what reason the pope would want to meet him and i think he was just another henchman I can't imagine why he would want to meet the pope but yes so that that's clearly but that's it isn't it that's just the false light thing celebrity is celebrity is celebrity um who just died? I saw a photograph this morning of, uh, it was Lauren Bacall, I think. Um, 
you know, Madonna and Cher and Lady Gaga, all of these kinds of archetypes, when they get to a certain, to a certain um, power zone, they, they all just hang out with each other and, and try to bump in front of each other to get the best angle at the camera, the paparazzi. Um, but I just don't know how ma- I was in that world to some great extent, you know. I've brushed shoulders in that with that set for 30 years almost. And um, I never met, you know, I, I, I've, I've met so many of those A-list celebrities. I've spent weekends at parties, hanging out with them by the pool. And, you know, I've not seen blood gurgling or gargling myself. I've not seen any of that. And I don't know how many of them are are involved, have been involved in that. This has been my dilemma, incidentally. This has been my dilemma. I've mixed with a lot of celebrities. They are nothing to do from the Steven Seagals, the Sly Stallones, and the, you know, the, the big, big, the big rock and roll bands. I, I've known these people, hung with them for years and years. I've never seen any of them. It's clear to me that none of them were were willingly participating in a Sabbatean agenda to subvert humanity through their shitty films or their shitty art or their shitty music. To me, they were just a utility of X, something operating from behind the veil. That's my takeaway. My, my take on that is that once you've been elevated to celebrity status, then you become separate from the rest of the chattel and then the people below believe that they will never attain that kind of status and therefore they are less than and they will never achieve great things like those people right. have. And right. so that's right. the psychology behind right. that. Right. right. Got it. I mean, Van Morrison, classic example. I had a phone call with him um, a couple of years ago on the eve of my Arise tour. I heard from a mutual friend that he, he wanted to have a word with me. And I've always idolized Van Morrison, just like um, Bob Dylan, you know, idolized. And um, I find myself on the telephone and he's telling me that I'm his hero and that I'm his, you know, he wanted to speak to me and give me support and talk about the activism work that I'm doing and say that he's watching everything I'm doing and they are watching everything I'm doing. Donovan as well. Do you remember Donovan from the 1960s? Yeah, I remember. Oh, love Donovan, yeah. So completely obsessively in love with Donovan. To this day, I'm in love with him. And I understood that he was a fan of mine, you know, and I'm like, what the fuck, you know? So these are guys who've been around. They're in their late seventies for Christ's sake. They're not in the basement and they are, they are A-listers in the sense of legendary uh, idols. So yeah, it's, it's six six of one and half a dozen of the other. I confess I'm still very confused by it all. Let's, let's move on to your next wonderful slide. Well, this is an example of, of shock art with the uh, gold-coated feces selling for thousands and thousands of dollars. We have the piss Christ there where there's, that was a photograph of Christ and the guy pissed in it and sealed it up. The, the Holy Virgin Mary is made with elephant dung. Then we've got the South African president giving some other leader of the world um, some kind of uh, sexual pleasure. And then this portrait of a child murderer, Myra Hindley, which is made with children's handprints. And it's a never-ending list of of really horrible ideas like the stolen ashes from the Holocaust victims. And then, of course, we've got our famous spirit cooking with Marina Abramovic and that stupid banana plastered to the wall. So... It's like they're using shock art to experiment with this kind of notion to raise the bar and take measurements as to the tolerable levels of madness, and then they raise it. Yeah, okay, got it, got it. And so that's that's also part of the helter-skelter language, um, which is binary, It's, it's flipping the hemispheres and forcing the hemispheres to flip because the more they can take humans out of true reason which is to say true conscience which is to say true consciousness which is to say sovereignty if they can bring about dissonance at the individuated and the collective level that's how they harness the utility of human plasma and then imprint the humans in order to get the angelic dna capacitance in humans to bring life force universal life force 
into the vector and then manifest a diabolical outcome. World War being, of course, a particular spectacle that these motherfuckers apparently enjoy. And they certainly, if you look at the images of Hawaii that we're seeing right now, uh, same shit that we saw a couple of years back with the, uh, with the Paradise Fires in, uh, in California, exactly the same thing. Robert David Steele, myself and others were screaming from the rooftops at that time. This is all smart meter technology. All of this is connected to that. And um, the test bedding happened in, in California. No one really raised too much stink about it. Everyone just went their way. A few thousand people lost their homes. A massive land grab happened. The test bed was perfect. Then there was a lull. And now we see the weaponization of government against um, humanity happening wholesale, like in Hawaii, when all the public services are withdrawn, where the gov governor is doing nothing and the mayoralty doing nothing to support the the donations and, and the aid getting to people. If anything, all of the emergency services appear to be working against any form of uh, sucker or, or, or remedy for the people on the ground. It's quite ab abominable to watch and to hear what's coming out of Hawaii on the ground floor. Presumably, you've been hearing a lot of that stuff as well. Well, I haven't slept well for at least three nights thinking about that and what they went through. Yeah. And speaking of that, you know, this 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 blinding of ourselves to horror and everything and trying to protect our poor little hearts from the, such a level of evil. Mm -hmm. So in, in the next slide, you'll see my third shock art image. And you see the father is taking his children to the gallery there. And what do they see? I mean, they must have sleepless nights after going to see that. And, and, and they say this is the safest kind of art that an artist can go into, the business of making today. And it's increasingly marketable art, which is also a disgusting commentary on society as it is today. And actually, the Chinese government has banned all use of corpses and everything in art now. Wow. <laughs> the cultural Marxists move against cultural Marxism. Exactly. Amazing. We'll never know if the CIA is still involved, but I'm sure they are to some degree. Because this Museum of Modern Art, the MoMA, that first started off with the Rockefellers, it was yeah. linked to the CIA by William Paley. What they were was that the, the CIA became the jurors for the art, and they selected a whole bunch of really anarchist artists. Without their knowledge, they used their art to present for this huge art show that would go to Europe and and you'll see later the images that they that they took there and it was all about the cold war and trying to show the russian people that the americans were so free they could paint about anything they wanted but the main guy behind that was this william paley character who was on the members board of moma yeah Plus, he was the cbs frontman and I read somewhere that he, he even established the CIA itself, but you can I, I can't find it again. It's one of those things you come across and then you never see it again. So it was he was about 50 years that he personified this power and influence of CBS. And you know, when he died, guess who showed up at his funeral? People like Nixon and Kissinger. Right. So he was a really key figure that we hardly ever hear about in history, and he had a lot to do with art. So he's on the board of MoMA, plus he had a $70 million art collection, and he was friends with Nelson Rockefeller, who you may remember was the vice president in the 70s with Ford. And um, I see it, there was a headline that said, William S. Paley gets off the CIA hook. So there was obviously some kind of scandal that went on with this guy and the CIA and being on the board of MoMA connected to the CIA. So I wanted to bring this forward to show how deep it goes and how much art is so aligned and connected with government and government policies. And the intelligence community, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So then this art 
that they made had this huge effect on making the art famous and worth millions. Because obviously Nelson Rockefeller was a board trustee of MoMA and and then he was vice president too. But they had been collecting all this art and then they'd saved it for the new American painting tour. But that was just one tour out of more than 50 exhibitions that were sent abroad by the museum's international program. Mm. So you see how they're sending it out into the world, and it all over the world, especially in the United States and Europe. And this is the kind of prices they were getting. They were getting Willem de Kooning, 137 million for that woman on the left, and and uh, 60 million dollars for Kazimir Malevich's Black Square. Curious. So these were the kind of things. I was very friends with, with de Kooning's wife. I knew her very well. Um, she died pretty much in poverty um, a few short years wow. ago. Well, yeah. that's another thing. See, the artist doesn't make all the money. They make it all. Okay. So if we, if we move on to the next slide, you'll see how they made art famous. So they sent the artwork that they themselves collected all across Europe and the U.S., and then they published them in art history books oh my curriculum. God which made the art renowned throughout the Western world and beyond. And oh, then- Oh, Lisa is the greatest painting ever made. It, the eyes follow you across the room. <laughs> and so then they put them up for auction at, at their other buddies, you know, Sotheby's and Christie. Right, right. For these exorbitant prices. And so it was never about the great masterpieces. It was what they could achieve politically, no matter how ugly and absurd the paintings were. Very and good. And they had us believing that it was great art. I and mean, then the other not, thing. Not to say that Monet isn't a great artist. <laughs> yeah, I believe Monet was a good one because he was part of the Impressionists and yeah. somehow they. That was what kicked it off because it really was beautiful art. And that was some of the first works of the collection of Abby Rothschild in the very beginning when yeah. she started MoMA. So it started off on a good good step, you know. But the, also these, 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 the something else part of their art collection is, is it, ha it has this extrinsic value as ascribed to things that are valuable only as a means to something else. And in this case with art, this this something else is the charity of, of philanthropists. But it, it looks like um, we skipped a slide and we need to go back one. Um, so there's definitely an issue. There we go, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, and, and so they have these causes that they often debut through all these art exhibit topics, you know, like climate change and transhumanism, transgender, COVID art shows, you know, shrouded in virtue signaling psychopathy. And, and also David Rockefeller himself, his psychotic dream was success in planning and plotting global governance, you know, like nobody else. He was arguing endlessly for China to adopt a capitalist communist third way model, as well as the West converging into a communist capitalist hybrid. So he used this money and it became almost seed money for all the other little agendas that he had going on beneath him. And then the so other- well, On he, this one, you know, the, the question is, did you find any other major influences of modern arts effect on culture beside the Rockefeller dynasty and the CIA? Well, it's my feeling that probably by now the CIA has handed over the arts to some other nefarious management section of propaganda because they yeah. got found out in 1995, 50 years later after that happened. Yeah. But one of the great turning points in art was the marriage of art and science when they had this great idea. And that really only helped the Rockefellers go forward because then they started creating all these scientific areas of interest to get into. And you know, remember in the beginning, 
they did they had the the education board that they founded and then remember with all their millions they started all these synthetic medicines with with the oil profits and that's when it all started so Indeed. So that, that's what gave them the leading edge in art because they were also into education so they could teach art how they wanted to teach it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is really interesting, this one, because this was the very, very beginning and they first opened up the Rockefeller Center. And the overall theme in the early 1900s, in the early 1900s there was a Rockefeller Art Committee and it dictated at the Rockefeller Center itself a really eerie prophetic statement from the Art Committee. And this is their statement. They said that these, being the murals, will explain man's new mastery of the material universe. So what you see there in the middle, it's called the conquest of disease and it deals with the development of modern medicine especially the concept of inoculations, which yeah. are by definition an artificial introduction of infection to cells and tissue, and I, I, you know all about that. So the art itself is showing us how long this death production has been going, because if you fast forward to today now, you've got the COVID global pandemic, <laughs> and we can see their obvious plans for the future. Yeah. Okay, so hybrid art is simulated genetic aberrations merging animals and humans. And extropism or extropianism is an evolving framework of values and standards using technology to continuously improve the human condition. And there was this big extropic art manifesto, and it was written as long ago as 1982. So here we have examples of Patricia Piccinini, who's a favorite of the Podestas and their Podesta art collection. And then you've got this crazy guy, Stellick, that tells us that we're in a time of circulating flesh. Yeah, staggering. I, that, I saw that artist, that ghastly creature with those horns, horned claws hooked around the little girl. Um, I, I went to that exhibition in, in the Saatchi Gallery about 10 years ago it must have been and saw that entire collection firsthand it was absolutely disgusting disgusting there was a little girl little school girl you know semi-clad i seem to recall a little girl with a dildo on her face kind of beautifully sculpted i have to say and um i i looked hard at this and looked at the um at the little moniker or whatever the the the, the, the label on the art piece, which of course was like three million dollars, and and it was entitled "The Two Faced Cunt," a schoolgirl with a dildo on her face, mm -hmm. and that that was about ten years ago. I was absolutely shocked to the core. I remember um, at that, and of course we've subsequently seen this connected to the Podestas, and the Clintons, and the Obamas, and the whole godless lot of them uh, in cahoots with this pornographicization movement but i think one of the most insidious emergences has been what we've seen really just in the last 10 12 years thereabouts so here what we're looking at is, is the final touches on the emasculation of women toward post-humanism yeah so do you remember the early visual male semblance yeah of the metal and finally we get to the to the hormonal, chemical, and surgical mutilation of genitalia in order to complete the job. Yes. And then, of course, this isn't new stuff. It goes back to the 1800s where you see this woman with the male genitalia, the sculpture, and then you see today what they're putting out there, just messing with our own logic. Yeah you know, defying natural biology, butchering our understanding of the meaning of words and the function of language and everything else, twisting it to a new level. And this woman here is one of the scariest women I've ever seen in my life, women I've ever seen in my life. And she is the one that introduced transhumanist arts. And the interesting thing about this is her manifesto was sent out into space to Saturn. That's right. 
spreading transhumanism far beyond the earth and out into the solar system. And the imagery there is very much all about coronavirus. You see that yeah, yeah. male thing in the blood and then you see the Hydra image too. And then this is her lovely husband, Mr. Moore, and he's a cryo preservationist and a futurist. And one of his statements is he says he cures death and he states that in praise of the devil, no more gods, no more faith. I won't go into it, but he goes on and on about the virtue of selfishness and becoming post-humanist and also worshipping Lucifer. And there's absolutely no ethics connected to this at all. They're going full ball on their own now. This is a great slide. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Welcome to the transhumanist laundromat. Yeah, in three yeah. cycles, you can become the antithesis of human through technological enhancement, not to be confused with med beds and life pods. <laughs> Very good. Very good, James. Okay, Saturnalia. So this is all about their end game scenario and the desired outcome, and but I don't think they will achieve it, honestly. No, certainly not. Because we've got David Rockefeller's all-consuming activism and planning mm. and plotting of global governance, and, and they've been seen for what they are now, you know? Yes, exactly. 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 And, you know, the pizza gate and all of that stuff really helping to expose um, the crime syndicate connected to Washington, D.C., and uh, Trump, of course, in the last uh, few years as well, the emergence of Trump, he came in as a battering ram as well um, to trash uh, many of these idols. Well, he also blew all the art departments away for what they were, but now they're all back and running again. Yeah. So obviously, I would be remiss not to mention AI, AI art. It's huge. It's consuming everything. We should be very concerned about it. We should be rejecting it. Yeah, you know, there's nothing more I can say. And even the, the titles of some of these pieces, neural decay, neural glitch technique, all of this stuff. And, and this guy, Mario Klingerman, he's an artist in residence at Google Arts and Culture. So, yeah. you know, if you've heard anything about AI and, and this is just the AI on this level, on this planet. Apparently, there's a super AI that does nothing but go around the multiverse and destroy all biological planets. And it looks like we got on their list. And the people who are doing all this and creating the system where we're going from synthetic, from orga organic to synthetic, are the, the little diminutives, regenerative diminutives that are their, their little busboys trying to do it to our little Earth. Let's see, where are we now? And this is that Damien Hurst you were talking about earlier that, you know, he burns his own art after selling after selling them. He has to because you need the digital representation of it. So I would keep going. But now NFTs too have plummeted. So there's hope. You know, it's slowly turning around. Yeah. And then this is modern day MoMA today. It's just fraught with bankers and businessmen and agenda-driven people. Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, largest corporation in the world, he's all in on it. He, he's financing the Chinese Communist Party. You've got Klaus Schwab, the Council on Foreign Relations. You've got many members of MoMA today are part of the CFR. They're all politically motivated. There's Larry Fink again with BlackRock. BlackRock financing the military in China. And that's the old MoMA there with the original woman who started it. And here we are back to the communist element where these artists are basically communists. And there's this Gary Allen, he wrote a book about the Rockefellers. And in it, he said, Communi communism is not a movement of the downtrodden masses but it is a movement created, manipulated, and used by power-seeking billionaires in order to gain control over the world. So right. we're, led, we're led to believe that it's all about capitalism, but in the end, it's not. It's all about communism. And here we had a, a little spat with Dago Rivera and the... Frida Kahlo. Yeah, 
and he he was asked to do a mural at the Rockefeller Center, but they had a big fight because. It looked like in the newspapers that he was pro-communism by inviting him to work on on that. And in the end, they just ended up covering it over with cement. Well, he was the, he was the real deal. Well, he was a communist, you know, and he had he played with them and had fun, you know. He, mm -hmm. he made Rockefeller standing there with a martini when this. J.D. Rockefeller Jr. said, you know, he didn't drink and he was faithful to his wife. And, <laughs> you know, and he painted Lenin in it right out there on it. So right. he, they had, they just had fun with him. Right. And then, of course, here you have, I put the whole gamut from the Renaissance and the purging of the indigenous people and spiritual people and the women, then to the prehistoric cave art, all the way through how they did it in every stage from Picasso through the wars to lesbians and gays, finally to the transgender art movement and the feminization of man, the pandemic art movement, the introduction of nanotech into the body, and then the human hybrid art. And finally we get to the transhuman and, and post-humanism, which is the end game, which we want to prevent. Yeah. And I'm just throwing back to the Renaissance here because that's where humanism started and here we are we've come full circle and now it's transhumanism yeah. and that Yuval Noah Harari and his homo deus book deus is another word for deity or god and so he wants to make us into these little mechanical technical chip little gods and here here it shows this endless conquest and how Art is, has been tied into the Crusades, the Industrial Revolution, all towards the full spectrum dominance plan, which, which we hopefully will never, ever get to. To conquer Earth by all means possible, to inventorize and surveil all lands and living beings. Wow, okay. And then, of course, there's a movement now for, it's called excessivism, you know, you shall have nothing and be happy. And then we've got the Ukraine. It's, I'm just showing you here how all the art exhibits, major art exhibits in major art museums show and push every single agenda from one world, one future to the pandemic, transgenderism and all of these things, the Ukrainian war, everything like that. And I'm showing here how the original lesbian gay movement, which was fine in itself, nobody realized that they were actually pushing the the long term, the long game was the transgender and how these artists are all working and how we were duped, you know, because how were we to know that the plan to co-opt LGBTQ would eventually lead to normalizing pedophilia promoting prepubescent sex change surgery and mutilation, and then the acceptance of true uh, trans. So be beautifully stated there, beautifully stated. I know that I've said things uh, recently that inflamed certain people to the extent that they resigned from working with me um, because they thought that I was accusing all transgender folk of being Luciferians. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, but what you've just elucidated here perfectly explains and what we're delving into here perfectly describes um and elucidates that that conundrum because it was a co-opting of the lgbg whatever the fuck movement and the whole they queered them queered them back in the day you know in the 1940s 50s and 60s and how queer them was um was uh, from the time of even going back to oscar wilde perfectly acceptable homosexuality has always been perfectly normal and perfectly acceptable within within society and that i think goes back you know what we think we know about the history of homosexuality is, is a nonsense it's rather like the civil rights movement it's just all manufactured guff but i'm glad you raised this uh, this particular um part of the, the conversation about it being an infiltration because it's sad. There's so many people, um, emphasis lesbians, bisexuals, and transgenders, uh, 
uh, who are left probably mortified because their legitimate um, movement was co-opted and into this perversified satanic agenda. Mind you, that the stupid ones will continue to think it's all about a rainbow flag and nothing else matters. But um, I think a great many of the more conscious folk there will feel deeply uh, mortified by that. I think it's a very well, good point. They've couched it in virtue signaling, and we really have to move back away from that and right. see the picture, which is what I'm trying to show because it is a very touchy subject. And then, of course, the ultimate goal coming soon adding the p for pedophilia right right exactly and then here are the the human hybrid and pedophile art collection of the pedestas we yeah. can move forward yeah. from here yeah. yeah and then you know Jeff one of the most Jeff horrible Jeff. things yeah one of the most horrible things is the modern art art scandal that was uncovered children being shipped in boxes and live art under the art for embassies program which was hillary clinton's little baby and that she turned that around it was originally established by kennedy in 1963 and it was a it was a bona fide thing but yes. now it turned it into this horrible thing and then then obviously the next horrible thing about art is the Getty Museum and all their little puppets that run around and serve their board mem the board members. And this very interesting and brave, courageous man, Stephen D. Kelly, he says, if I say there are 100,000 sex slaves under the Getty, sue me or arrest me because he, he remote viewed it and he saw it. And I looked up the history of the original John Paul Getty a horrible, horrible man. He would marry someone and then just ignore them, but they would have his children. Then he, then they'd be so sad and upset they would just leave him. Yeah. And then all yeah. his spawn have gone on to continue, like this Anne Gilbert Getty, on all yeah. these different yeah. boards, art boards at the Met. And then, so all that connection there. So I don't want to dwell on this, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting quite deeply involved in this story, just so you know, the Getty story. So that there's some stuff that's going to be coming out. And um, yeah, it's as real as real can be by best accounts. Well, if we weren't rushed for time, I could tell you a lot more, Sasha, but let's move on. So the, finally, this uh, diversity situation and, you know, race bias and all this stuff is coming home to bite these elitist butts because now, you know, they've hired these, for want of a better word, brown and black people that, you know, they put them in these positions and now they're all saying, no, you know, you're all, you're elitist, you don't pay us enough. You know, there's been these strikes. And I think it, the days of these mega art institutes are over, you know, they can't have it both ways. Yeah. And then I really want to drive this point home is that I said earlier too, we know the names of all these great artists, but do we know the name of our local artist? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. I know the name of our local artist, and it's my own name, but I don't know any other ones. Yeah. And then finally, the standards of Grand Tartaria, you know, how they were building and creating everything in resonance, and we have to return to that and use our artistry. I'm sure that... All the children of the people of Tartaria were born knowing that they were creative geniuses. They didn't even put their name to the art they created because they were all creating together for the beauty of mankind. Absolutely. Bang on. Bang on. It's something I'm going also so far into at the moment. Uh, Jane just getting ready to do some tour dates and big theater events on this. Really, this subject is the main focus for me, um, understanding understanding the, the fall from grace, so to speak, um, which is just incredible. The more I'm learning about the, the great exhibitions and, uh, and um, electrification and all of that, some incredible um, photographs are, are coming out of the basement. I don't know if you're following much of it, but there's so much new material uh, that's coming up. What, you mean the new technologies that we can use and incorporate? Well, showing, yeah, no, just showing the, showing the testament, testament, so I mean, photographs that are 
coming out of the basement of people being handed over and being published on the web. And then this is nothing to do with AI stuff. This is old stock footage coming out of the basement in Detroit, in, you know, in, 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 in New York, in Paris, in Vancouver, um, showing these great exhibitions. I don't know where this flood of material is coming from, but it just seems to be an exponential thing that the photographic evidences, which can be forensically attested, um, are emerging now exponentially demonstrating what the world looked like in the 1800s compared to what it looks like uh, in, the 20, in, the, in the 21st century. Here we are, second to last slide. In contrast to today, you know, the Tartarians saw life as art and mm. the post-Tartarian reset usurped art for its own gain and destroyed our creative currency by design. And this is what we have to get back to and realize that we were all born creative geniuses. Beautiful, beautiful. I think I got this down to a fine art, Sasha. Certainly have. <laughs> so i just talk about in ending let's talk about art as it is art as it should be and then art as it always was so right now it's severely underutilized discipline and a subconscious visual mind control program of soul fragmentation mirroring toward a post-humanist end game by subverting prime creator sources sacred role in creation and natural evolution and art, as it should be, is a portal to creating divine existence on earth by bringing heaven to earth using the abundance of elements at our fingertips to manifest an entirely harmonic 5D environmental canvas. And then as it always was in the past, art as it always was is it was an extension of divine human expression connected to cosmic intelligence that naturally expressed itself alchemically as easily as breath fills the lungs. Wonderful. Wonderful. Beautiful. Darling God, that is, that is a fantastic slideshow. I think we showed 60, 66 altogether. Um, okay, takeaway, takeaway. Just, just um, we've we've seen the cave art that you've revealed as being an orchestration in the main. We've seen the the Renaissance and how that extraordinary axiomatic time in the collective memory bank appears to have been a programmed um agenda and now we're seeing modern art very clearly for what it is which is a satanic agenda saturnian logic perversification uh protocol or complex um and it all speaks to the um degradation of humanity um, a complete debasement and violation of all that is natural and all that is divine. So the net net takeaway from this trifecta that you've presented to us of cave art, the Renaissance, and now modern art is that um, art wholesale has been the utility of the devil. So where in all of that melee has the real craftsman, the real artisan, the real artist stood? Well, I think, you know, we're going to have to be, go back to those people who have skills that actually help us in our lives. Those must be the true artists. But what I want to say is I want to thank everybody who's taken the time to, to work with us on these elements about art because in understanding this, this is what is going to elevate us forward out of this situation by taking the time to understand it and to know that we were born creative geniuses and it's time to pick up the pieces and start working toward when we get to the other side of this horrible, satanic dream spell that we've been living in. Well, 
you couldn't have said it more perfectly. I mean, we just literally took us to one at one and a half hours exactly, a couple of minor edits possibly. Um, but I'm very, very thrilled by this. I'm going to go back and watch it again myself uh, tonight, and I want to study these plates uh, more closely. But um, last question to you, Jane: Is there any integration of um, of this study that we've seen uh, with the with the trifecta of cave art, Renaissance, and modern art? Is there any integration with the New Earth? Uh, university and teachings that you're doing through the university. Absolutely, Sasha. That's my next step. I will present it as a complete art history curriculum for the New Earth University. So when anyway, can we expect that? there's a lot more information. I left out a lot of information in my presentations to you because we had to keep them short and sweet. So there's a lot more information. <laughs> And I'm, it's my hope that people will take this and spread it out there and let people know, you know, it's, because art is just, it is a standalone metaphor for everything that's going on in the world. It's just incredible that, that it is that. Indeed. Well, Jane, um, I don't know what's next on the agenda, but there has to be another agenda or I'll get stoned to death by the Lazarus audience. So you better dream something up quickly. And just thank you so much again for a beautiful conversation and another fantastic revelation thank you well my pleasure sasha and i love talking to you goodbye